We turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. Hebrews chapter 2. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's found on page 692. Hebrews chapter 2 this morning. Our focus is going to be on verses 5 through 13, but um, 5 through 18 really forms one whole unit. So we're going to read that entire passage this morning. So if you found your place in your copy of God's Word, if you will stand with me in the honor of its reading as we look at Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 5 and going to the end of the chapter This is what the Word of God says to us today. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honor putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Father, I pray that you would speak through your word today. May your spirit go forth, convict us of our sins, open our eyes to see Christ. And God, I pray that my brothers and sisters here might be encouraged and that they might have hope. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Did you know that there is a science of hope? It's true. Scientists have done research of the phenomenon which we call hope. In 2002, a University of Kansas study found that students low in hope had greater anxiety and performed more poorly than students with more hope. I can't help but wonder how much money they spent on that that research. In 2011, a group of Malaysian and Hong Kong scientists found that cancer patients with greater hope had reduced anxiety and depression. But their findings were inconclusive on whether hope created less anxiety or people with less anxiety were more hopeful. And in 2017, Chinese psychologists found that hope protects the brain against against anxiety. Uh, They believe they've also discovered the location where hope originates in the brain. Um, It's the bilateral medial orbitofrontal cortex. Uh, It's this area of your brain right above your eyeballs. It's been found that the feeling of hopefulness actually changes your brain as the brain releases chemicals. All of this tells us that the world 
recognizes the need for hope. And it's trying to find ways to help people become more hopeful. Arizona State University even has a center for the advanced study and practice of hope. But whereas unbelieving scientists can make accurate observations due to God's common grace, such as the relationship between hope and anxiety, as is often the case because the fall has affected our minds and the way that we think, Secular psychologists don't usually offer accurate help. And so they look for the part of the brain where hope originates. The part of the brain that they say is also related to the production of motivation, of problem solving and goal oriented behavior. And they draw the conclusion that since this is the area of the brain in which hope originates, that in order to foster hope, you should work on intentionally setting goals and working towards them. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with setting and working towards goals. I would encourage you to set goals and to work on reaching those goals. But if you're committed to a materialistic worldview where it's all about what's going on inside the brain and the goal that you set for yourself, and this is what hope means then you're always going to struggle to maintain that hope. You're always going to struggle to hold on to that hope. This is not what we mean when we talk about hope. Nor is it what the Bible means when it speaks about hope. And the hope that the Bible speaks about is not a hope that is centered on a certain part of your brain. Rather than hope being about what we can do, biblical hope is placed in the promises of God. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. J. Adams wrote, hope in the scriptures always is a confident expectation. The word hope never carries even the connotation of uncertainty that adheres to our English term, as when we cautiously say, I hope so. There is no hope so about the biblical concept. Theologian John Frame has said, hope is not something radically different from faith, but it is a kind of faith It's faith directed toward the future fulfillment of the promises of God. Since it is based on God's promises, it is not something tentative, uncertain, the way in which we usually use the word hope in modern life. Rather, it is firm and certain. The words faith and hope differ only in that hope has more of a futuristic emphasis. Or we can think of it in terms of the lordship attributes. Faith is directed towards God's authority because it focuses on the word. Hope focuses on God's control, which will bring his words to pass in the future. But of course, you can't have faith without hope or hope without faith. Some of the things that we see in the scriptures is that our hope is in God. Our hope is the gospel. Hope is obtained by faith. Hope comes through the scriptures. Our hope does not disappoint. Our hope is focused on Christ and his return. Hope motivates godly living. Hope motivates evangelism. And for our purposes today, for our scripture passage, hope helps us persevere. We need hope. And that hope is based on the certain promises of God that he has given in his word. Therefore, we can have hope for the future. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, calls it a living hope. We don't have a dead hope. We don't have wishful thinking. We have a sure, certain, living hope. And it is hope which the author of Hebrews now gives to you. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18 is one of the most difficult sections in the entire book. 
Not because the grammar is difficult or because the concepts are hard to grasp. It's because commentators are divided on what point the author is trying to make. The transition from verse 4 to verse 5 and the reason for it cause each commentator to stress different aspects. Um, as I was studying for this passage, I would open one commentator and they would say one thing and then I would turn to another commentary and they'd say something different. And by the time I was done, I had a massive migraine. But I want to help you with this. I don't want you to leave with a massive migraine. I don't want you to leave with a headache. I want you to know what is happening in this passage. Remember, our, our author has been arguing for the superiority of Jesus. The revelation God has now given in Jesus is superior. It's better than the revelation given by the Old Testament prophets. Jesus is superior to the angels because he is Yahweh, the one true God. He, he took on flesh and is the Davidic king and Messiah to whom all authority is given and to whom all obedience and worship is owed. His person is superior to the angels. And therefore, the message that he declared is superior to the, the Mosaic law delivered through angels. And so, as we saw last week, we must pay much closer attention to the, the message, the, the word of the gospel that's been declared to us, lest we drift away and perish. But the question still remains, where does verses 5 through 18 fit into this argument? Some commentators argue that verses 1 through 4 are actually a parenthesis, and the author is picking up where verse 14 of chapter 1 left off. Others say it's a continuation of verses 1 through 4. Some say it's, it's picking up the idea that Jesus is superior to the angels, and so this is part three to Jesus is better than the angels. Others say that the point is answering an objection to Jesus' deity based upon his death. I'm going to take all of these and wrap them up into one big ball, and I'm going to say that these verses are included to give encouragement and hope to struggling and doubting Christians. I think that this, this passage, it's, it's not just random, it doesn't just come out of nowhere, but, but the author of Hebrews, he includes this here after this warning passage for a particular reason, and that reason is to give hope. If you'll remember from last week, verses 1 through 4 is the first of five warning passages. And these warnings are addressed to real Christians, it's not hypothetical, it's not for someone out there, it's to you. It's, it's written to real Christians to warn you against real danger. And so they function like the warning label on a bottle of poison. If you drink this, you will die. In the same way, these warnings are saying, Christian, if you ignore the gospel, if you abandon the church, if you try to find salvation in anything or anyone other than Christ, you will certainly perish. The rational person will read the warning label and, and not drink the poison, and so they won't die. The true Christian will read this warning passage, and by the preserving grace of God will believe the warning, pay attention to it, and will not apostatize. They will not fall away. There are five of these warnings in Hebrews. But remember, they're warnings. They're not descriptions. He's not, he's not saying that they have already fallen away. He's warning them of the imminent danger. You're, you're coming up close to the edge. Pay attention to the message. Come back so that you don't fall. And he gives these serious warnings. But after hearing these serious warnings, believers maybe you even, might feel discouraged or even hopeless. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is the least severe of all the warnings. They get stronger and stronger as we go along. And, and so you might feel discouragement as you read them. You might feel like you can never live up to this. And so being a, a good pastor, the author of Hebrews after each of these warnings, he offers the readers hope. And so in chapter 4, verses 15 through 16, we have a great high priest who sympathizes with us in our weakness so we can confidently draw near to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace in our time of need. 
After the warning in chapter 6, verses 9 through 20, he feels sure of better things for these believers because they have the promises of God that serve as a sure and steady anchor for their souls. After the warning in chapter 10, verse 39, we do not shrink back to destruction because we have faith and preserve our souls. After the warning passage in chapter 12, verses 18 through 24, we can persevere because we have come not to Mount Sinai, but to Mount Zion and to Jesus. And so I believe that verses 5 through 18 of chapter 2 functions in the same way. We have a strong warning not to drift away in verses 1 through 4. And now in 5 through 18, we have an encouragement. We have a hope. And so we can pay attention to the gospel and not drift away. And so I believe that this passage, it fosters hope. How does this passage foster hope? Verses 5 through 18 form a complete thought. But unless you want to be here until about 2, 2 2.30, we're going to break this into two parts this week and next. But we still want to maintain the unity of the text. And so this, this passage as a whole, verses 5 through 18, it's, It fosters hope not by telling you to set goals and to find ways to achieve them. It's not by blind optimism. This passage fosters hope in your heart by causing you to turn your gaze upon Christ Jesus. The main point of chapter 2, verses 5 through 18 is this. Through his incarnation, death, resurrection, and glorification... Jesus, the Son of God made man, can help his people when they're tempted. And that's meant to give you hope. That's the big picture. I hope that you see how that fosters hope in believers who are being pressured by the culture, by family, by the government to abandon their faith. There is a Savior who has entered into our weakness And by his suffering and glorification, he can now with certainty help you when you're tempted. And so we'll divide this big portion, 5 through 18, into two smaller portions. And today we're going to look at verses 5 through 13. And this section is meant to foster hope in your heart by reminding you of three things. It's meant to foster hope in your heart by reminding you of three things. First, God has a purpose for humanity. Second, all of God's purposes for humanity are fulfilled in Jesus. And finally, God intended for Jesus to bring many sons to glory. So let's look at verses 5 through 8 again and see that God has a purpose for humanity. God has a purpose for humanity. Look at verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. That four, that that first word of verse five, it connects this passage to what's come before. We must pay much closer attention to the message that we have heard, lest we drift away from it, because we won't escape future judgment. The gospel message has been verified by an abundance of witnesses, but we have to look even further back before this warning to look at verses 10 through 14. And we see there that That Christ is the one who laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. He is the creator. The heavens are the works of his hands. They will perish, but he will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. And he will roll them up like a uh, a robe, like, like dirty laundry. He will toss them aside. They will be changed. But he will remain. When Christ rolls up this old, worn out, fallen creation like a garment and ushers in the new age of verses 11 through 12... Verse 5 of chapter 2 tells us it is not to angels that God is going to subject this new world. Who will he subject this world? Who will inherit the world to come? If it's not angels, who is it? It's 
to mankind. It's to mankind. That might surprise you. It's to mankind. We understand this because this was God's original design. Look at Psalm chapter 8. We've already sang it. We've already read it. Let's look back at Psalm 8. Keep your place in Hebrews chapter 2 so that we can go back to it very quickly. Psalm chapter 8. We see at the very beginning of Psalm chapter 8 a superscript. We don't want to ignore the superscript. It's in the original Hebrew. And so we see that this is a psalm of David. David here is reflecting on the days of creation. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Verse 3, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Look at verse 6, you've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. David is reflecting upon creation. Days one and two, God creates the heavens and the earth. Day four, he fills the heavens with the moon and the stars. Day six, day five, the sheep, the oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds, the fish. He's working his way backwards. And he says, when I look at all of these things, when I look at the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. But even though we are insignificant in terms of the vastness and the magnificence of God's creation, David says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Even though we're insignificant, when we look at all the stars in the night sky, we see how, how vast and innumerable is all, are all the, the, the celestial bodies. And we think, I'm so small, I, I, I'm just a speck, I'm smaller than a speck. David is reminded that God has given authority of the earth to man. That's what Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28 tell us. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. David is simply paraphrasing Genesis 1, 26 in Psalm 8. Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Psalm chapter 115, verse 16, we're reminded the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. Now, this doesn't mean that God has abdicated his his rulership over earth. He hasn't created it and said, all right, guys, you're in control. I'm out of here. It means that God made man in his image. And he gave to man authority. And he gave them a job. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. They're made in the image of God. He wants them to multiply. He wants them to fill the entire earth with the image of God. And man was to rule all, over all creation, not as a, as a lone king, not, not as someone who's independent of God, but who rules as God's representative. Man was to be king on earth, but he can only rightly rule as he reflects God. As he reflects God's righteousness. God has a purpose for humanity. Now, how can this reminder foster hope in your hearts? Well, it's it's good to remember that this was God's original purpose for man. Man is not some kind of cosmic accident. 
He, he's not the, the product of millions upon millions of years of evolutionary process that began with, with just a single-celled organism and, and we have just evolved from something that swam in the sea to, to something that slithered around on the ground to a, an ape. Now, here we are. You guys are listening to me talk. Congratulations, you've made it. This is not God's design. This is not what we're told about. God's original purpose for man was as a unique, distinct, special creation made in the image of Almighty God. And made to have dominion over creation, over this earth. We were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with the image of God, ruling under God's kingship. And this, we are reminded in Hebrews, hasn't changed. God's purpose hasn't changed. That, that's why it's even brought up in Hebrews chapter 2. God's purpose was for man to rule over creation, and that hasn't changed. And we ought to be reminded of this, and it ought to foster hope in your heart, because when you look around at our world and you see how dark and chaotic it is, how, how rebellious people are, devoid of God, following their own destructive passions and pleasures, when we see how our culture will defend the murder of babies with all their might and how politicians only feel safe to regulate how and when these murders take place, when we see the absolute destructive and absurd behavior of a society that believes that gender is fluid, when we see the, mass, the madness of our cities and, and our politics, it ought to give us hope that God's purpose for mankind hasn't changed. Psalm 8 didn't come with an expiration date. And so you can read the headlines, you can watch the news, and you can still have hope. A Christian is never to be given over to cynicism or pessimism because we have hope. It's also helpful to remember that God's purposes have a goal. History isn't going around in cycles. Everything just repeating. It's heading somewhere. This isn't because humanity is becoming so evolutionary and, and, and so, so um, technologically advanced or enlightened. Rather, it's because God is sovereignly ruling over all events and he is bringing history to its intended goal, to its intended end. And so for the believers who are tempted to go back to the temple and priests and animal sacrifices, for anyone who might be tempted to go to the church of Rome and, and to their priests and, and their mass and, and to their empty rituals, if you're being tempted to go to any other religion that's focusing on, on keeping these outward rituals, you're going backwards. You're going the wrong direction. Because God's purposes, they're, they're heading towards a goal. And, and they don't go backwards. The storyline of the Bible, the, the storyline of history, it's moving towards an end. And God's purposes for humanity will be accomplished. That's the first reminder, and, and that should give us hope. God has a good purpose for humanity, and it hasn't changed. That purpose is to put everything in subjection to him. Not to angels, but to man. And Psalm 8 is that reminder. And putting everything in subjection to him, as Psalm 8 is reflecting on Genesis 1, and now we're being told in Hebrews chapter 2, this is still the purpose. He's left nothing outside of man's control. That's the first reminder. The second reminder is that all of God's purposes for humanity are fulfilled in Jesus. Verses 8 and 9. 
Now I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Psalm 8 is a wonderful description of God's purposes for humanity. I love that we, we sang it and we read it and then we came back and we're looking at it again. This psalm should be just rattling around in your brain as you leave here today. It is a wonderful description of God's purposes for humanity. There's just one problem. We don't see it. We don't see it in reality. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Look again at Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. You've given him dominion. But dogs still bark at us. And cats still scratch. Mosquitoes still bite. There are still tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. And we still suffer from diseases and viruses. So much for everything being in subjection to humanity. It's not what we see, right? We read this and we say, well, it's, that's, that's a nice picture, but it's too bad. It's too bad that that's not what we see. That's not what we experience on a day-to-day basis. God gave dominion to all creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, but man's rebellion in Genesis chapter 3 means that not only are we fallen in our thoughts and our desires and our words and our actions, but we live in a fallen world and we experience natural evil. You still suffer from allergies, you get the flu. You have migraines. Got to watch out that you don't get bit by a tick. Break your leg. You lose your house in a fire. We live in a fallen world. And this world, as we look around, it seems like it's out of control. And, and God's promises, they seem hopelessly optimistic. But just a fantasy. That's our evaluation if we only use our two eyeballs and even these glasses remind me that those don't work very well. But God will accomplish every single one of his purposes. But you must see it with the eyes of faith. We do not at present yet see everything in subjection to him, to mankind, but what do we see? But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. This is the first use of his name in this book. Everything's been building up to this climax. God has given a a superior revelation through his son. And here's who his son is. He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. He has made purification for sins and he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And we have this description as he's laying out his argument. And now he says, we don't yet see everything in subjection to, to humanity as God's original promises were, but who do we see? We see Jesus. And Psalm 8, as Philip said earlier, is ultimately all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. But if you look at Psalm 8, you have to wonder, how, how does he get here? How, how does he get from Psalm 8? It's, 
It is about man. What is man? The son of man. And, and we come to Hebrews chapter 2 and now it, we're talking about Jesus. How do we get here? We have to understand who Jesus is. We have to understand that, that the, the biblical storyline, remember the purposes of humanity, God's purposes are moving somewhere. They're moving towards a goal. And so in Genesis chapter 2, he gave all of dominion, all authority to Adam. Adam was given authority. He was supposed to be fruitful and multiply and have dominion over the earth. He was a king. God put his king in a garden temple and he was meant to, to work it and keep it. But through rebellion to God's law, Adam lost it. And the world and humanity have been thrust into chaos and decay, rebellion and sin that ultimately terminates in death. But Jesus entered into our fallen world and he obeyed God perfectly, even to the point of death. He came into the world as the last Adam. The one who, who represents humanity. Adam represented all humanity and, and the garden. And when he fell, all of humanity fell with him. Jesus represents a new humanity. And in his obedience, he represents his people before God. He is the last Adam who succeeded in every single way in which Adam failed. Observe the connections that the author of Hebrews is drawing between Psalm 8 and Jesus. He was made for a little while lower than the angels. In his incarnation, Christ clothed himself in humanity. The, the true, eternal Son of God took on flesh. Becoming truly a man with all of our weaknesses. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He was lonely. He felt pain. He who made the universe, the one we read about in verses 10 through 12 of, of chapter 1, the, the self-existent, eternal, unchanging one, took on frail humanity. The one who is all-knowing, all-seeing. He had to take a nap. Because he got tired, he was made a little lower than the angels. But now he's crowned with glory and honor. Verse 9 tells us that Jesus was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. See, Adam was crowned with glory and honor in the garden. He, he was created as a king. Jesus is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. This is Philippians chapter 2. You can hear the echoes of Philippians chapter 2 in, in verse 9. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. That's the suffering of death that we see in Hebrews chapter 2. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He obeyed to the point of death, and now he is exalted. He is no longer lower than the angels. He was made for a little while lower than the angels, clothed in frail humanity, but now, because of the suffering of death, because of his resurrection and glorification, he is superior to the angels in every single way. That's what chapter 1, verse 4 is all about. He has become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Because of his incarnation, because of his obedience, even to the point of death on a cross, God has highly exalted Jesus and he has crowned him with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And Psalm 8 
says that God puts all things, everything in subjection under his feet. And we see that the author of Hebrews, he's making these connections between these Old Testament passages. We already saw in chapter 1, verse 13, this quote of Psalm chapter 110. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? He's never said that to an angel, but he said it to the Son. The Son who is the last Adam. The perfect man. The one to whom Psalm 8 ultimately points. God has a purpose for humanity. It is for humanity to inherit the world to come. The world to come is not subjected to angels. It's subjected to mankind. But in our fallen state, there's no way that we can inherit this. There's no way that the world to come is going to be subjected to fallen humanity. And so the perfect representative, the last Adam, the one to to whom Psalm 8 is really all about, He comes into this world and all of God's purposes and all of God's promises find their fulfillment in Jesus. Not one promise fails. God is good. He never changes. Therefore, he cannot lie. And so who are all these promises made and kept to? They're kept for Jesus. He is the goal of of all of God's Old Testament revelation. And so the author is is talking to believers here, and he's talking to you, and he's saying, don't go back. Don't fall away. And don't for a second think that something's gone wrong or that God's word isn't true because your eyes and ears are, are telling you that things are wrong with this world. We may not see everything in subjection yet, but already we see Jesus. We see Jesus. And his rule isn't on hold. God didn't hit the pause button when the New Testament opened on Matthew chapter 1. This has always been the plan. There is no plan B. God's purposes for humanity are fulfilled in Jesus. And the author of Hebrews says that we see Jesus He was made for a little while lower than the angels, but now he is crowned with glory and honor. Jesus is ruling right now and all the promises of God are fulfilled in him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. Does that give you hope? God's word is true. God God will complete all of his promises. Not a single promise will fail. All of them will be kept. And they are kept in Jesus. That's the second reminder. God has a purpose for humanity. All of his purposes are fulfilled in Jesus. But the third reminder and the one that we want to to ingrain in our brains is that God intends for Jesus to bring many sons to glory. We do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. God is accomplishing every single purpose he has in Christ. And this is a marvelous reality. This this is big news. God is not somehow foiled like some bumbling sitcom dad because Adam sinned in the garden. The last Adam has overcome But while this might be big news, while this might be history-encompassing news, it's only good news if you're involved. See, if I tell you that 
there's going to be a huge party, there's going to be a huge carnival after church in the parking lot. Huge. There's going to be a tent, and there's going to be cake, and ice cream, and music. There's going to be a petting zoo, and and everyone can eat as much as they like, and they can take some home. It's going to be great. But you're not invited. That's big news. Your eyes might get as large as dinner plates when I tell you about it. But it's not good news. It's not good news. Because it's not really good news unless you're able to participate in it. It's the same here. Here is big news. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He has become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Everything is being put in subjection under his feet. Nothing is left outside of his control. He is crowned with glory and honor. Big news. But it's only good news for you if something happened to enable you to join in. To come to the party. And that's where verses 9 through 13 come in. God is accomplishing all of his purposes in Christ And the good news is you can be a part of it. There's the hope these Christians need. Don't give up. Don't fall away. Pay much closer attention because God has done great things for you. Because of his suffering of death, Christ has been crowned with glory and honor. But by the grace of God, Jesus didn't die for himself. He died as a substitute. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, he, God, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, so that in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. On the cross, God laid on the shoulders of his perfect, beloved son sin, our sin. And Jesus suffered the wrath and justice of God for sinners. God's holiness and his righteousness, his his justice demands that he punish sin. The good news is that on the cross, Instead of punishing believers, God punished Jesus. Jesus propitiated or or he satisfied God's wrath. And since Jesus is the eternal, perfect son of God, he was able to fully satisfy God's anger against the sin he bore. And now God is no longer angry with those for whom Christ died. That's what this phrase means at the end of verse 9. So that by the grace of God, Jesus might taste death for everyone. But what about that word everyone? The Greek word is simply all. He tasted death for all. Does this mean that Jesus bore the wrath of God for every person who ever lived? Did he satisfy God's wrath for every single person on the planet? We'll see this more clearly next week, but that simply can't be the case or else hell would be empty. 
For how can God's wrath be fully satisfied on the cross and yet he still punish sinners? And what we see throughout this passage is a very clear particularity. As we go through, we're going to see that he's, we've got words like many sons, brothers, the congregation, the children God has given me, the offspring of Abraham. He helps the offspring of Abraham. He is a merciful high priest who makes propitiation and helps his people. Christ's death is definite and particular. So what does the author mean when he states that Christ tasted death for everyone? Remember that the the idea is that Jesus is the last Adam. As the first Adam represented humanity in his rebellion and fall, so the last Adam represents the new humanity. When Christ lived, died, and was raised, he was doing it as a representative for these people for whom he intercedes. So what does it mean that Christ tasted death for everyone? It means this, that everyone who trusts in Jesus as Savior can say without doubt or fear, Jesus died for me. It means that if you're trusting in Christ, you are new humanity represented by Jesus, the last Adam. So as Jay said, there's only two categories in the Bible. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're either being represented by Adam or you're being represented by Christ. And what the author of Hebrews is telling us here is that for everyone who is trusting in Christ by the grace of God, Christ represents them. That should fill you with hope. That should fill you with massive hope. Your salvation doesn't depend on your works. It doesn't depend on you taking a lamb to a temple and having a a human priest kill the lamb and pronounce you forgiven. It doesn't depend on you sitting in a confession booth and saying ten Hail Marys and seven Our Fathers. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the priest. Jesus is the lamb. And he tasted death for every believer. So that by the grace of God, our hope today, tomorrow, and on your deathbed is not I walked an aisle and I said a prayer and I got baptized and I joined a church. No, on your deathbed, your hope will be Jesus died for me. Our hope is Christ alone, apart from works. That's your hope. And this was God's plan. We see in verse 10, it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. This was God's plan and it was fitting. It was proper. Jesus uses this word with John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It was fitting, it was proper, it was good, it was appropriate that God the Father, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder or author of their faith, of their salvation, perfect through suffering. Now, as we go to verses 14 through 18 next week, this idea is going to be expounded upon, the the idea of why Jesus had to come as a man. And so we'll, we'll see it more clearly next week. But for now, it's enough for us to be reminded that Jesus is our representative. It was fitting, it was proper, it, it was good that this happens because for us to be redeemed, we had to have a perfect representative. The wages of sin is death, and you don't get off the hook. Have you sinned? You deserve to die. And the only way that you can be set free from that is if a representative dies for you. A death is owed. A death must be paid. 
And so it was fitting that, that God, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. He is our representative. His life was lived for us. You haven't obeyed God's law perfectly, and that's terrible news. That's devastating news. But the good news is that Jesus obeyed perfectly for you. You might be thrown off by this this idea that Jesus was made perfect through suffering. How can Jesus be made perfect? Isn't he the perfect son of God? How can he be made perfect? Of course, in his deity, he is perfect. There is no, there's nothing that's lacking in him. He's perfect. But remember that throughout this this text, throughout this passage, the author of Hebrews is focusing primarily on Jesus' humanity in his incarnation. And so in his humanity, Jesus learned obedience. He never sinned, but as he learned God's word, he learned obedience. And as he, as he went through life, as he had normal human experiences, he learned how to obey God. He learned how to, to trust God He trusted God's word. He trusted God's promises. And and through the the situations in his life, he learned how to apply God's word to his life. And so he learned obedience. And he learned obedience even to the point of suffering death. He was made perfect through suffering. As Jay says often, and if you were in his Sunday school class this morning, this is kind of a repeat, Jesus didn't use cheat codes. He didn't use cheat codes to navigate through life when it got tough. He didn't press pause when when there was some temptation and, and the God nature took over. He learned to be obedient and he was made perfect through the things that he suffered. And this might blow your mind. Jesus lived by faith. He lived by faith. He lived by faith in the word of God. We have to be careful not to mix the attributes of Jesus, the the two natures. As, As God the Son, the divine nature knew all things, but in his humanity, his human nature didn't know what would happen 30 seconds in the future. He didn't know what a day would bring. He had to live by faith. He had to believe the scriptures. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the the divine man, Jesus, truly man, studied and meditated upon God's word. And by faith, he lived it out. Just like you have to. Just like you have to. And the hope that we have is that Jesus represents us. It's good news for weak, sinful, often stumbling, doubting, fearful saints. We fail often and we fail spectacularly. We have a perfect representative. And we have this this promise. We have this, this reality in verse 11. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. Literally, that just reads, they are all of one. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one. This is known as the doctrine of the union with Christ. And it is a precious doctrine that that too few preachers proclaim and too few Christians meditate upon and think about. We've got this this buddy Jesus theology. This Jesus is is my friend and he's he's beside me and and he gives me, he kind of whispers in my ear and tells me good things to to do. He gives me some wisdom. Or we have this idea that that Jesus is my co-pilot. That's that's not accurate. The, The biblical model is that we are brought into union with Christ. He is our representative. 
We, we are, are bound to him. We, are, we cleave to him. And, and so Jesus' people belong to him like a wife belongs to her husband. You may have a buddy Jesus theology. Or you may be on the other side. And you may have this theology of this distant God who, who stands aloof. Or you may have this warm theology that, that tugs on your heartstrings. Jesus is my best friend. But the truth is so much richer. Jesus looks at his church and he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And he cleaves to his people and nothing can separate them from him. Look at the way Hebrews describes the relationship in verses 11 through 13. I love this. I love this sentence. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says again, Behold, I and the children God has given me. This affection that Jesus has for his people. He's not distant from you. He doesn't look from, from this, this great chasm. He loves you. He's drawn near to you. He's, he's drawn, the author here is drawn from Psalm 22, the, the suffering servant who, who has his, his hands and his feet are pierced. And as God brings him to salvation, as he brings him through death, he says, I'll proclaim your name among my brothers. I'll tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. How often do we think of Jesus as singing? And he sings the glories of God, the mighty works of God, and he does it in the midst of the congregation because he wants us to join him. Verse 13, we have references to Isaiah chapter 8. I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Jesus is the prophet who trusts in God's promises through hardship and suffering. And, and his people, his children are evidence of God's promises. This notion of Jesus learning and trusting of being made perfect through suffering, it may be new to you. It may be even shocking to you. And I think it's because a lot of Christians have forgotten his humanity. We need a representative who is just like us. And, and next week we'll hear more about this. And, and the truth is we have one. We have a perfect representative and He's not like our representatives in, in D.C. that, that we, we, we vote for them and we elect them, but they don't really pay attention to us anymore. And they're just in a, a new category, a new class. They're distant from us. We have a representative who is near to us as a brother, a, as a father. What hope this ought to produce within us. If it's true that the feeling of hope affects the brain, then you should be feeling all the endorphins right now. Yes, we must be careful to pay much closer attention to what we have heard because the danger is real and, and we are so prone to drift. Have no fear. Have no fear. Don't be dismayed. Don't be discouraged. Jesus loves you. Saints, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. We hear it so often that it's just like, yeah, I know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves you. He, he loves you. He cares for you. He's near to you. By, by the grace of God, he has tasted death for you. By the grace of God, the Spirit has been poured out into your lives. The Spirit bears witness that you are children of God. The Spirit brings you into union with Christ 
He who sanctifies and the ones who are being sanctified are all of one. And so he's not ashamed to call you brother. He doesn't hide his face from you. He doesn't, he doesn't dread the family get-togethers because you might be there and you might do something that's a little embarrassing. He's given everything for you. And look back at verse 10. It's fitting that the one for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. He brings. He he doesn't hope to bring. He doesn't try his best and his hardest and and he's he's just looking for you to put in a little effort. He brings definitely, unfailingly, many sons to glory. That's true hope. That's true hope. Pay attention to the message that we've heard. Lest you drift away from it. But know this. Jesus is going to bring you home. Your elder brother loves you. He sought you out, and he is going to bring many sons to glory. The Heidelberg Catechism. Question number one. What is your only comfort? And I think we should just change that word to hope. What is your only hope in life and death? That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who, with his precious blood, has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, all, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. You who are here who have never trusted in Christ, in what are you hoping? Where's your hope found? Are you adopting a worldly hope? Setting goals, determining how to meet those goals, so uncertain, so unsure. Today, you can have real, living, lasting hope. It's found in Christ. And saints, saints, Christians, yes, we're supposed to to heed these warnings. And yes, they are serious. There is a serious threat. There is a serious, serious danger We have a Savior who saves. It's not the angels that God has subjected the world to come. It is to Christ, the perfect man. But he won't be there alone. He won't be standing on a new new earth in a new age alone. He's bringing his people with him. So pay attention lest you drift. But the hope is that Christ is going to bring us in. This is the goal. This, this is where the story is heading. Look to Jesus. God has a purpose for humanity. All of God's purposes are fulfilled in Christ. God intends and will fulfill his promises to Jesus in bringing many sons to glory. And so we can have hope. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for sending Christ. Thank you that he took upon himself humanity 
He was made just like us. And he obeyed, he walked by faith, and he was made perfect through the suffering of death. We thank you that in these things we can have hope. Forgive us where we doubt. Forgive our sinful fear and unbelief. God, I pray that your word will go forth, that it will have its full effect in the hearts and minds and lives of the believers who are here. Help us to look to Jesus as our only hope. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.